Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon. We have an open phone line for you if you want to call in with questions you might have about the Bible or the Christian faith. That's what we do here for an hour. You can call in. We'll talk about it. You're welcome also to call in if you hear anything on the show that you don't agree with and you'd like to balance comment, perhaps present an opposite case. We'd love to have you do that. The number to call is 844-484-5737. There's a lot of eights and fours there at the beginning, so let me give it to you again. It can be confusing. 844-484-5737. And we do have one line open right now that's not yet taken. So if you get a busy signal, just call back in a few minutes. There might be a line that will open up, but right now there is a line open. Okay, let's talk to um, who's Joe from Dallas, Texas. Welcome to the Narrow Path, Joe. Thanks for calling. Yeah, I just um, love you so much, and I've been on fire just like you uh, for Christ my whole life. I'm about 74 years old. I was a college professor, and all of my teaching, I would meet with my students one-on-one and uh, ask them what they believed and try to love them into to Christ's teachings. I know that the disciples sort of uh, let Jesus down a lot. So I know that humans, even the disciples, let Jesus down. And then my question to you is, Jesus said one of the last things, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's my understanding of human beings. And I love how you have learned about the Bible, but when Jesus says love your enemy, and your neighbor. That means I, I want to love everybody right away. They don't deserve my love, but I want to love everybody. So uh-huh. Jesus said, forgive everybody, for they know not what they do. Doesn't that mean that we can't resist loving God at the end, and he's going to save everybody? Well, you know, there's certainly a number of people who believe that that's what the Bible teaches, and that's one of the views that is presented in my book, of The Three Views of Hell. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen the book, but I have. Uh, I, I argue without advocating any one view, but I do give the arguments for and against each of three views. The third view is that God will ultimately conquer everybody, even though some of them will not repent until they've gone on to the next life, but that some believe there is a chance for repentance after that, too. Uh, the fact that Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, certainly is a, uh, an indication that there's no one who can do something so grievous that God will not be disposed to forgive them. But we don't know that Jesus' words were intended to apply to every human being. I mean, there's some specific people he was looking at there, perhaps the Romans who were nailing him to the cross. They certainly didn't know what they were doing. They're just following orders. They don't know anything about God or Jews or the Messiah. He was just another, as far as they knew, another criminal delivered to them to execute, and they certainly were ignorant. Uh, Peter, on the day of Pentecost, uh, or I think it's actually in the next chapter, in chapter 3 of Acts, he tells the Jews that they're the leaders who had crucified Christ, says, I know they did it in ignorance. So there was some, some measure of ignorance also, even on the part of the Jews who condemned Christ. But, uh, in, but their ignorance was less excusable. I mean, they certainly had had a chance to analyze Jesus and make some decisions about him, where the Romans probably had never heard of the guy before, before he was handed over to them. But there's not an indication here necessarily that Jesus is praying for everyone in the world, though I don't think he, I don't doubt that he would. I just don't know that that prayer was intended to encompass the whole world. It does tell us, though, that even the people against whom Jesus would have the most reason to hold something against them, those who are killing him when he's done nothing wrong, uh, he is certainly disposed to forgive. So we know that God's attitude towards sinners is not what it has often been represented to be by some preaching. Uh, God is on the side of the sinner. That doesn't mean he can forgive every sinner, because, of course, uh, forgiveness in the sense that saves requires a restoration of a relationship, and that's got to be both ways. I mean, uh, you can love your children even when they're in rebellion, but the relationship with them will not be what it needs to be unless they also love you back. I mean, the prodigal son, for example, was related to his father, and his father certainly loved him unconditionally and forgave him instantly when he came back. But as long as his son was in his own heart alienated from his father, he was, as the parable says, lost 
and dead. That's what the father said. My son was lost. He's now found. My son was dead. Now he's alive. So, you know, the fact that the father loves everybody is not a guarantee that everybody is going to be in a saving kind of relationship with him that, that he would desire for them. So that there is, of course, man's part necessary. And there are certainly people who seem to be dead set against God in this life. Now, the, the question that I often wonder is, do these people really know who God really is and what he's really like? I mean, uh, it seems to me that if people knew God as I know him and as Jesus revealed him, that loving him would be much more irresistible. Not entirely, because there were people who saw Jesus and hated him too. <clears throat> and they saw what he was like, but they didn't want him. But uh, there are many people today who probably are rejecting Christianity as it's been presented to them. But, but they haven't really seen what Jesus is like. Many times the Christians they've seen are not very much like Jesus. And that's our fault, not theirs. Um, so it's hard to know. I mean, God knows if somebody is rejecting him ignorantly or not. Um, and that, that was the case with the ones that Jesus prayed for from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So there was certainly an ignorance there that God was willing to overlook. And all people who rebel against God are in some measure ignorant, but sometimes not enough to make them really innocent, I think. So we'll just have to see. I mean, if you know, there is that viewpoint, some people believe that God will continue to work on the unrepentant sinner even after death, and perhaps uh, perhaps they will turn around. But that's only one of several views, and many people would say the Bible would forbid that possibility. Yeah, I'm, I'm just hoping the Holy Spirit is stronger than you and I understand. And Amen. I, I hope everybody's saved. So God bless you. All right, Joe. God bless you. Thanks for calling. All right, we'll talk next to uh, another Joe, this one from Las Vegas. Joe, welcome to The Narrow Path. Good to hear from you. Hey, Steve. Good afternoon. How are you today? Good. I am the guy who emails you probably twice over the last three or four days, and they were medium-length emails regarding right. Deuteronomy 25. What is it? Deuteronomy 25 for Don't Muzzle the Ox. Right. Paul uses, uh, I think, First Corinthians and, and uh, the first letter to Timothy. Hey, by the way, yeah. you know, I'm entitled to the yes. So you get that. And, it, and it's to me, when I add that together, and it, it, it addresses something you just said to Joe in Dallas about maybe Christians not representing themselves so well, which has made it really difficult for me to be in fellowship for extended periods of time. I have, I'm in Vegas, there are a lot of great churches. But it becomes this, I think I used in my second letter the word a conundrum or a circular argument. Or We apply that teaching, what I view, that Deuteronomical law as fulfilled in Christ, as some sort of legal right or obligation of Paul's quoting. And then we add to it Hebrews 10, 24, 25. Don't forsake the gathering of the saints, I know you know that. So the issue is now, I have to be in fellowship, and I have to pay somebody... And I've literally been in church, and I'm, I'm talking to people and going like, but you see me here, right? <laughs> it's, it's not like I'm out cavorting somewhere. But it gets to be this, like a heavy-handed thing that if you're not actually in fellowship regularly and or contributing to a teacher of sort of teacher pastor, there's a heavy feeling of condemnation that I've experienced in multiple fellowships, and it's perplexed me. Okay. So that's why I wrote you. Right. Are as, we, I re are as I recall, yeah. in, your, in your first email, I think you were bringing up the, the passage in Deuteronomy about uh, do not muzzle the ox that treads out the grain and saying, you know, we're not under the law, and therefore, you know, should people re really be applying that? Now, the fact that Paul applied it does suggest that he felt like it was relevant to what he was saying. But does you know to say we're not under the law, it doesn't mean that there aren't principles and uh, ethics and so forth in the law that reveal the heart of God. And that's the important thing. We're, we're not under the law, but we are, we do search as, as David did and as, and as Jesus did and, and as all godly people have, we search the scriptures uh, to see what we can learn about God's heart, what God wants and so forth. Not because we have to keep laws like keeping festivals and and dietary laws, but rather to get at where his heart is at. And Paul treats some of those laws that had to do with animals, for example, 
as sort of a, a hint at how God feels about people. Not that animals and people are the same, but remember when Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I believe the reference to a yoke is a reference back to Deuteronomy saying you don't plow with an ox and an ass together. An ox being a clean animal, an ass being an unclean animal, you don't yoke them together. So likewise, you don't yoke clean and unclean people together. You, a Christian, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship does light have with darkness and so forth? Now, Paul's taking a law that actually talks about how to treat farm animals. And the same thing with don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. And he indicates that this gives us an idea of kind of, in the case of the muzzling the ox, sort of God's idea of justice in a way. And we are God is concerned about justice. We're not under the law, but we are concerned to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. And so, I mean, Jesus said the weightier matters of the law are justice and mercy and faithfulness. So he's saying, you know, the law, which says don't muzzle the ox while it's treading out the grain, is essentially reflecting a sense of justice that extends even down to the animal level. That is to say, an animal that's working hard should not be deprived of its food. Now, Paul takes that principle and say, by the same principle of justice, you don't want to deprive any worker of the food he needs to continue doing his work. And in both cases, you mentioned 1 Corinthians 9 and uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, when Paul quotes that, he's referring to people who are working, laboring in God's field as uh, people like himself, you know, the apostles or teachers. Or I mean, Paul did say in Galatians 6, those who teach, or he said those who are taught, should share with their teachers in all good things. So there's a general sense in Paul's teaching that people who work should be paid. The labor is worthy of his hire is what Jesus actually said. And he was talking about the, the disciples being supported when he sent them out two by two in Matthew 10. He said, you don't have to take money with you because the labor is worthy of his hire. That is God, who is your employer, will see to it that you are fed. Now, those, that feeding will come from people. But the idea is there is a certain justice, whether, it's, whether we're talking about animals and not muzzling the ox as it works so it can eat, or, or, or a laborer you know, earning a wage and being paid that wage. Um, Paul is applying that, and Jesus, in that case, was applying it to the fact that some people's labor is not labor that generates a paycheck. Now, most people are in jobs that do. And therefore, you know, if somebody mows your lawn, you should pay them what you agreed to pay them for it. If they wash your windows, if they fix your car, you know, these people are doing a job that, that they get paid directly for. But ministers are not supposed to be paid directly because they're not supposed to be selling their service. Jesus told the disciples, freely you've received, freely give. A minister should not be selling the word of God. He shouldn't be selling his services to Christ. Uh, he's a slave. On the other hand, he is working. He's working as truly as anyone else in any other field is working and should be fed. Uh, not necessarily salaried, but, but fed, supported. And that's how the early church understood it, I think, is that the men who are full-time in ministry, they don't have the time to go out and get another job to support themselves, so they would be supported by, the, I believe, the free will offerings of others. The reason I say free will offerings is because uh, the, the man couldn't charge, and therefore any money he would receive would not be something he charged to the audience or to the people he ministered to, but it'd be something they freely gave. Now, you've been apparently turned off by some bad policies in the churches that, uh, you know, that, that want to force you to be regular in their church services. So they quote, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together from Hebrews chapter 10. And they apparently want you to feed the pastor. So they say, don't muzzle the ox. Um, you know, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing, nothing wrong with a man teaching the Bible the way Paul taught it. Therefore, if your pastor is teaching through 1 Corinthians or teaching through Deuteronomy, or teaching through First Timothy, and he comes to the passage that says, don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. There's, there's no reason why he can't make the point that Paul made about it. But on the other hand, if he's complaining because the people in the church are not giving enough money, then, then I'd be concerned. I'd be concerned about his motives. You know, why should a man who's preaching as a servant of God be concerned about how much he gets paid? Uh, I, I've never seen any connection to the amount of money that I am given, on the one hand, to the amount of work I do. I don't, I don't, I'm not a, a wage laborer. I don't, I don't get paid by the hour. I work all the time. I do my work full time 
and God pays me what he wants to. He provides as he wishes. Sometimes that's plenty. Sometimes that's, you know, bare bones. But no minister should be complaining necessarily. And if God's not providing enough through the people rather than, uh, you know, chastise the people for it, I would I would much rather go out and just get a, a job myself. That, you know, if I... If, if there wasn't enough support for me, for example, coming in from people who want to support me, then I'd go out and, and get a job. Now, uh, if that took me out of the ministry, then I guess that wouldn't be a good thing, but there'd be a possibility probably getting a job that still allowed me to do some ministry. But you're, I do think that the use of that passage in Deuteronomy is legitimate because Paul used it. But it's not the same thing as saying we're under the law. It's rather saying God expressed a value in the Old Testament when he, when he gave that command about oxen, that even animals that work should not be prevented from eating. You should feed the animal if it's working for you. And so also, if, if true of animals, how much more for men? In fact, that's what Paul says about this in 1 Corinthians 9. He quotes the passage from Deuteronomy, don't muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain. Then he says, does God care for oxen? Or does he say this altogether for our sakes? So he's actually seeing... God giving a lesson about how we're to treat other people in the law that God gave about how to treat animals. So there's principles there in the law that reveal the heart of God and, and the sense of justice that God feels about certain things. And that's why I think Paul can use those kinds of illustrations from the law without placing people under the law. After all, if he was placing people under the law, the law only says to, to make sure you feed your cattle as they tread the corn. It doesn't say anything about giving money to ministers. Paul's making a, an application of the principle, the general principle of the labor is worthy of his hire, even if it's an animal who's laboring. So, so much more ministers is what he's suggesting. But ministers should not be, in my opinion, making an issue about money given to them. And in many cases, now I don't know what kind of church you were hearing this from, but in many cases, they want you to give money to the church, and the church will give the pastor a paycheck. Uh, but it won't be all the money you gave him. So even giving money to the church isn't necessarily feeding the pastor. It might be helping to build a new gym uh, for the church or something like that. You know, uh, it's hard to know what the money's being used for. I personally prefer to give money directly, if possible, to the people that feed me rather than through an organization, having it sifted through and have them get a paycheck or something. Because I, I personally prefer, and I think in the New Testament church, it's how it was done, more of a personal sharing. You know, somebody shares with me something of value, I, get, I share something back of value with them. It's person to person, not not my relationship to an organization that then siphons the money out to different things. I, I'd rather give to the charities and to the individuals that I really want to support. Anyway, uh, I understand, I think, the, the question and the concerns you had. I need to move along before we run out of time here, but... Uh, I hope that answers the question you wrote to me about and that you bring it up here. Uh, let's talk to Jeffrey from San Francisco. Jeffrey, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. I hope you had a wonderful Easter. Um, Thank you. Steve, uh, i said many times this life is a time of testing, and uh, every experience a person has in their life, it's within the will of God uh, in terms of, I mean, his two wills, I should say, his divine will and his, his, uh, you know, uh, the will in which he just, well, nature or things to take their natural course. And uh, so my question has to do with Christ's temptation in the wilderness by the devil. Uh, that was a necessity, wasn't it, in order for him to uh, succeed in his mission? I believe it was. I think it was, it was necessary for him to be tested in all ways like we are. Yes. Okay, that's interesting because um, what would you say is the ultimate temptation? And does everybody or will everybody experience the ultimate temptation, if not in this life or after they die? Well, I don't know that the Bible really speaks of an ultimate temptation. And in terms of human experience, I don't think everyone would find the same temptation equally tempting. I think for different people, it'd be different things. Some people are very strongly tempted with drugs and alcohol. I've never had a temptation even for a single second in my life to get drunk or to or to use drugs. So, I mean, that wouldn't do anything for me. But my temptations may be along lines that other people don't feel much temptation about at all. It wouldn't. I mean, the things that really challenge me, if presented to certain other people, might not be a challenge to them at all. So I don't think there's an ultimate temptation 
across the board that applies to all people. But uh, there are certainly some temptations that are more severe than others in, in the case of every individual. Certain people have mm-hmm. weaknesses that others don't have. Uh, perhaps if we wanted to be real general, the, the largest temptation is to put oneself first ahead of God. Mm-hmm. But in terms of evil, Steve, would you say that there's an ultimate temptation? Well, I, I, as per what I said, I, I don't really know that there's one. Are you asking, is there one sin that's the most grotesque sin? Is that what you're asking? No, because the greatest temp- I'm sorry. The greatest temptation a person can be tempted by evil by the devil himself. I believe that was that was uh, presented to Christ when he first encountered Satan. Uh, I mean, the Bible says he was tempted in three ways, like to jump off. The yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure I understand your question because uh, I already answered your question as to whether there's an ultimate temptation that a person can experience. Uh-huh. But but then you're asking again. So I'm wondering: are, are you asking is there some tem- is there a temptation to a particular sin? which that sin is the, is the greatest sin or something. Is that what you're asking me? Uh, well, yeah, I guess you can put it. This involves spiritual warfare. So I would say Christ okay. experienced this, even though it wasn't written in the Bible. Uh, the ultimate temptation by the devil, if you were to meet the devil himself, would be for him to try to seduce you and to take it on a demonic nature, like what he did with a third of the angels. His, he has a very powerful, seductive uh, temptation. It, I see. So you didn't you didn't really have a question. You had an answer, and you want to see if I had the same answer. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if that's a. Very, I don't think that'd be a very strong temptation for me because I wouldn't want to be taken over by demonic powers. But some people do find that tempting, and that leads a lot of people into into the occult and so forth. I appreciate your call. Let's talk to uh, Chuck from Las Vegas. Chuck, welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yes. Hello, Steve. Hi. Yeah, I'd like to, first of all, thank you for your ministry, and God bless you, your family, and your ministry. Thank you. I just have a, a quick question here. I know, you, I know you don't watch the news that much, but suppose there's some archaeologist that has found the uh, Ark of the Covenant, they say. But in that case, along with that, in Revelations, I'm sure you know, 11, 19, where it speaks of the heavens opening up, or the temple opening up in heaven, and you can see the Ark. Does that, can we take that at all, literally, or how should we take that? Well, in Revelation, quite a few of the items from the tabernacle are seen in heaven. I mean, there's there's a altar, and there's souls at the at the base of the altar in chapter six. Uh, there's of course seven lampstands. Uh, there's they're not necessarily a seven tiered, a seven branched lampstand like you have in the tabernacle, but you've still got the seven lamps. Uh, you've got uh, the Ark of the Covenant there in chapter eleven, as you pointed out, and and there's also others. Uh, things from the temple. There's the Holy of Holies. But these are not the earthly ones. These are seen in heaven, and therefore these are not the earthly furniture of the earthly tabernacle. But remember, when Moses was instructed in the building of the tabernacle and in the instructions concerning building the furniture of the tabernacle, God repeatedly said to him, make sure you make everything according to the, the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. Now, this suggests that God had a pattern or prototype of the tabernacle and the furniture of the tabernacle, which was revealed to Moses. Uh, We could argue that this was uh, something that, you know, the parallels in heaven, that he was, you know, that heaven was open. He saw the same things that that John saw in a way. John saw, you know, the tabernacle and the the Holy of Holies and those things in heaven. Now, Moses was told to build earthly counterparts to them and to make them after the pattern of what was revealed to him. So it's it's not really reasonable to understand that John saw the physical uh, Ark of the Covenant that Moses built and that it was now in heaven. Uh, I don't think I don't think any of the furniture that Moses built is in heaven. I don't it's it was made out of physical materials to be on earth. Heaven is, I believe, a spiritual realm. And, and that's where the the parallels are. So no, I don't. I, just, I don't think so. I don't I think the tabernacle. Saying, I was just saying it's always been so precious to the Lord that maybe He had it in Him. Okay. Well, let me just say this about the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, I don't know that the Ark was ever as as precious uh, to the Lord as what it represented was precious to the Lord. It was the it was the you know emblem of the covenant, and the covenant was precious to God. But the emblem 
I think I think the Jews kind of tended to, um, you know, superstitiously kind of revere the Ark of the Covenant uh, in a way that that was inappropriate. And so they thought that if the Ark was with them in battle, they'd win, even if God hadn't been on their side. And it, and it says in Jeremiah, it, remember Jeremiah is the one who predicts the new covenant. And in Jeremiah chapter 3, he says in verse 16, Then it shall come to pass when they are multiplied and increased in the land in those days, says the Lord, that they shall no more say the ark of the covenant of the Lord. It shall not come to mind, nor shall they remember it, nor shall they visit it, nor shall it be made any more. Now, I think he's talking about the new covenant, which, of course, began with Christ when he came. And he's saying, you know, there's not going to be any more relevance of the Ark of the Covenant. If they found the Ark of the Covenant today, as some people claim they have once in a while, uh, I don't think it would be of any relevance except as an in, a point of interest. You know, I guess relics from the past are interesting, but it wouldn't be uh, spiritually significant because the Old Covenant is over and there's a New Covenant and the Ark is no longer relevant to Christians. I appreciate your call and your question, though. You're listening to The Narrow Path. We're going to take a break. We have another half hour ahead, so don't go away. The Narrow Path is listener supported. If you'd like to go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, you can take resources there or donate if you wish. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back in 30 seconds. Small is the gate, and narrow is the path that leads to life. Welcome to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Steve has nothing to sell you today, but everything to give you. When the radio show is over, go to thenarrowpath.com where you can study, learn, and enjoy with free topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and archives of all the Narrow Path radio shows. We thank you for supporting the listener-supported Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. See you at thenarrowpath.com. Welcome back to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are live for another half hour taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian faith, you can call here and we'll talk about them. If you see things differently than the host does, feel free to call. We can talk about that as well. The number is 844-484-5737 if you'd like to call. I will be broadcasting all week next week from Honolulu, where I'll be teaching for Youth with a Mission in the Manoa Valley all week long. And, uh, you know, if you happen to be listening in Honolulu right now, because we are on on the radio there, uh, if you're interested in setting up a a, a gathering of some sort and uh, want me to come, I've got my evenings mostly free. I'm teaching in the mornings every day. And you can get in touch with me. My email is steve at thenarrowpath.com. Let's talk next to Travis from San Diego, California. Travis, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, I've got a question. Uh, what do you think about Amish people? What do you believe in? The Amish people are a branch of the Anabaptist movement that started uh, right after the Reformation in the early 16th century, uh, shortly after Martin Luther began what we call the Reformation. Just within a couple of decades, there was a uh, what they call the Radical Reformation, that was uh, started uh, really with some people in Switzerland who had been students of Ulrich Zwingli there, and they felt that uh, the Reformers had not gone far enough back to biblical practices and that the Reformers were still baptizing infants. And these uh, young students of the New Testament said, you know, in the Bible they didn't baptize infants, they only baptized believers. I think we should be, all of them had been baptized as infants because all Europeans pretty much were and they said, we, we've we become believers since we were young. We were baptized before we were believers. We should be baptized after becoming believers. And so they were called Anabaptists, which refer, which means rebaptized or baptized again. Now, this was actually a very controversial position to take. And the, the original people who did that in Switzerland were killed by, by the reformers. Uh, they were actually, Zwingli himself, uh, favored the death of over 4,000 Anabaptists who were martyred uh, under his watch. And so also in other parts of Europe, they were persecuted and they fled. Uh, eventually, most of them fled to America. And the branches of the Anabaptist movement that are still with us would be the Mennonites and the Amish and the, uh, the Hutterites, uh, the Hutt communities, they are uh, Anabaptists also. 
and there might be some others like Mennonite Brethren and things like that. Now, groups like that, they are evangelicals. That is, they do believe in Jesus. They do believe in the scriptures. Uh, they are what we would call Christians. Uh, they have views that are distinctive of the Anabaptist group. Uh, now, the Amish have their own distinctives that don't are not shared with the Mennonites and the Hutterites, but um, but Anabaptists in general, they believe in only baptizing uh, converts, not babies. Uh, they believe uh, in pacifism. They, they believe in peace and non-resistance. They don't believe in taking any oaths, including in court and things like that. Uh, their women typically cover their heads in worship, as most, uh, as, as many other groups do. Catholics do the same thing, and so do many other groups. They're not really very different in belief from other evangelical Christians, but in the case of the Amish, they have some distinctives of their own, like, of course, everyone knows about their avoidance of, uh, of moving with the times in terms of technology. Uh, they limit the technological changes that they allow to come into their communities because they don't want to be, uh, they don't want to be, they don't want technology to control them, basically. And anyone now who has a, uh, a smartphone uh, and is on Facebook and, uh, and has YouTube access knows very well how modern technology can simply overwhelm you. It can become dominating. Uh, they were wise enough to foresee that long before there was an Internet. Uh, even moving fast in cars is something that has caused a lot of deaths that didn't occur and wouldn't occur if everyone was in horse-drawn carriages. But... Uh, you know, they, the Amish have uh, been perhaps extreme in this, and m many of us do not want to share in their lifestyle in terms of low-tech. But, but there's certainly nothing wrong with their choice, and in some respects, the wisdom of their choice is vindicated by the harm that's been done uh, by the advances in technology. Of course, I'm not, I'm not arguing that the advances in technology are all bad. Certainly some good things have come from it, too. But there, there's really nothing... Uh, you know, wrong with those distinctives. I will say this, Amish communities often are not so much interested in, in stressing conversion, personal conversion. That's more, they have more of a group or community dynamic. And uh, in some cases, the Amish don't even want to have pockets on their shirts because if you have a pocket, someone might put something in a pocket that someone else doesn't have, like a pen, and someone else doesn't have it, and it distinguishes them too much from others. They want to more blend into a, a sort of a cultural uh, corporate oneness. And they sometimes think that if you express concern about individual conversion, this can almost be too self-concerned and not community concerned. So, I mean, they, they have some things about them that are not really, uh, in my opinion, very balanced. Um, on the other hand, uh, I, I do believe that they emphasize following Jesus, and that's what I would emphasize too. So I, I certainly couldn't say they're not Christians. I would say that the Amish, if you go to an Amish community, just like if you go to uh, a, an Assembly of God church or a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church or a Methodist church or any other kind of church, you're going to find some people there who are probably members of the church, perhaps people raised in the church, who aren't really converted. You know, the church... The church stands for the truth, but that doesn't mean everyone who's there has experienced personal con conversion. I, you'd find that, of course, among the Amish as well. All right. Okay, thank you, Steve. All right, thanks for your call, Travis. Okay, our next caller is uh, Steve from Springfield, Oregon. Steve, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Hi, Steve. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. So I got into a conversation the other day with someone, and it I'd heard on the news myself referring to Jesus as being a Palestinian. And we got to discussing, and then we went, and we started talking about the, the Palestine. And so actually, I was just looking for uh, your take on that. And well, it depends on there. how you use the word Palestinian. Pa the, name of the, exactly. the name of that part of the world was called Palestine in, in the right. old days. And therefore, people who live there could be called Palestinian, just like you'd be called an American cause, or an Oregonian because you live in Oregon. Now, the, the, there was no race called the Palestinians in those days. The term Palestinian, referring to a, uh, an ethnic group, was coined in modern times. 
to refer to the yeah. Arab the Arab groups that lived in Palestine uh, for many centuries before the Jews came back in in the uh, 20th century. Uh, the Jews, of course, in the 20th century came back and took control of the region, and the Arab people who were already there, and their ancestors had been there for 1,300 years, and I always thought of it as their land, uh, these people, when when discussed in contrast to the Israelites, uh, were called Palestinian. But that's mainly because of, again, the region they lived in, not necessarily because of their race. It so happens that the Palestinians, or those who are called by that, are, are Arab people. Though uh, there's I don't think there's any reason to uh, say that they are uh, ethnically homogenous. There's lots of different Arab tribes and so forth. But um, th- to call people Palestinian today is simply to refer to the Arab populations that were in Palestine or Israel before uh, before Israel became a nation and have continued to live there and, and be in conflict with the Israelites there. But in Jesus' day, there was no racial group called Palestinians. Jesus was Jewish. Uh, he was you know, descended from David and the tri- tribe of Judah and so forth. So it's it's kind of disingenuous if someone says, well, Jesus was a Palestinian, and, and to suggest, therefore, the Palestinians today are the same, you know, people as Jesus. Well, that's not exactly true at all. People today who are called Palestinians, they're called that name by a very new definition that only came into being at the time of the conflict with the, the people of Israel coming back to Palestine, and they had to have a name for the people who already were there, so they called them Palestinians. But they were Arabs, and so Jesus pa- was not an Arab. So, so Palestine would would not, you couldn't confuse that with the Palestine with the Palestinians then? Well, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, Palestine, is- Palestine is that part of the world. Israel, in the time of the Romans, was called Palestine, and Jesus lived at that time. Right. So. Um, and, and at other times it was called Palestine. It was, it was called Palestine until, you know, modern history too. Uh, but that's, that was a term, actually Palestine is a name for the region that was given it to, to it by the Romans. It's actually a form of the word Philistine. It's because it was viewed as the land where the Philistines had been. Um, and they were there before Abraham was, you know, so before there were any Israelites there, the Philistines were there. Um, and the Romans named that region not after the Israelites there, but after the Philistines. That, the word Palestine is uh, etymologically related to Philistine. So, uh, so that, that term you know, was applied by the Romans, and it has stuck for many centuries. But obviously, when the nation of Israel was formed in 1948 in that land, the land ceased to be called Palestine. It ceased, it's, now it's called Israel. But it's the same land. And Jesus lived in that land. But he wasn't called a Palestinian, except in the sense that anybody who lived in that land, no matter what race they were, could be called a Palestinian. Just like I said, if you're in, you live in Oregon, and you're, uh, I don't know what race you are, but let's just say, just for the sake of argument, let's say you're uh, uh, of European extraction, and you might have a neighbor who's from Asia and another neighbor who's from Africa, and you're all, in a sense, different races, but you're all Oregonians. So, you know, to call you an Oregonian doesn't tell us anything about your ethnicity just about where you live. And so Jesus, in that sense, would be a Palestinian. He lived in Palestine, but he was Jewish so by that, ethnicity. The Palestinians are not necessarily descendants of Philistines. The Philistines no, are. no, not necessarily. No, it's the, the land is named after the Philistines because the Philistines were there for so long. And uh, it's very possible that the Philistines are essentially an extinct people. Uh, but there are some people who think there are still some Philistines, um, and there's some people who think there's still some Edomites and some Moabites and people like that. Those those were all nations that were pretty much wiped out as nations in pre-Christian times. When, by the time Jesus came, there was no nation of Edom or nation of Moab or of, of of the Philistines. But some of the people descended from them might still be around. It'd be awfully hard, I think, to distinguish who would be and who would not be. Well, and the genealogy in Matthew kind of gives credence to to uh, Jesus's background. Well, absolutely. Right? I mean, yeah, the genealogies of, of Jesus make it very clear. He's Jewish. He's descended from the tribe of Judah. That's what a Jew is, someone who's descended from Judah. So, uh, yeah, and the, and that's a different ethnic line than the Arabs. So he's not Arabic. But you, but you could have uh, Palestinian Jews as well, but that's just who would have been converted probably. 
Well, Palestinian right. Jews would be Jews who live in Palestine, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, I, I, what I'm trying to make clear is we can talk about people in terms of their ethnicity, which has to do who, who their ancestors were on the one hand, or we can talk about people in terms of their geography. And when people say Jesus was a Palestinian, they're talking about his geography, not his ethnicity. When people say Palestinian today, they almost always are referring to somebody's ethnicity as well as the geography. All right. I appreciate your call. I hope that's finally clear. Let's talk to Scott from Roseville. Scott, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Now, no man is to be a certainty to another man, but the Scripture can be. Would you agree? I don't even know what that means. You are absolutely 100% correct in your views that Jesus was talking about the people who were directly involved in his crucifixion and death and not the entire human race for the rest of time. Here are the scriptural facts that back you up. You can argue this from this day on. Jesus, as a child, amazed the teachers with his knowledge of the Torah. Or I'll tell you script. what, Scott. Scott, it doesn't sound like this is a, a direct question, so I'm going to have to move along to the people okay. who actually do did have questions. Fruit of knowledge, did the fruit of knowledge give mankind forever the knowledge to know when they were doing things wrong? The fruit of the, no- the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did, did we convert- know good and evil from there? Well, we have a conscience. Uh, basically, right. the... Yeah, we have a conscience, so we know there's good and evil. But as far as the contents of each man's conscience, well, that would... has to be educated. All right, I, uh, Scott, I'm afraid that was that call is. Uh... By the way, folks, Scott calls a lot, and uh, sometimes it's hard to get much of a clear question from Scott. But I, Scott, I, I have to move along because I can't even understand what your questions mean a lot of the time, to tell you the truth. And uh, and a lot of times you want to make more statements than questions, so. I'll, I'm going to take another call while we have time for some of them. Uh, Let's talk to Derek from Dallas, Texas. Derek, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yes, Steve. um, Good to talk to you. Thanks for taking my call. Um, Mm -hmm. I have a question about Jesus. Okay. We all know Jesus. Uh, In the scriptures, it says Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, and he's the Son of God in heaven, Son of God on earth. Okay. But why, when Jesus was ministering and, and walking every day, teaching people, why did he refer to himself as the Son of Man? Why, 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 why did he call himself that? Okay. Well, I think he called himself that because he was both the Son of God and the Son of Man. He was a human being, and he was God incarnate, as I understand it. Now, of course, the mystery of the incarnation is still something that many people would explain different ways. Uh, differently than I would, perhaps. But I understand Jesus to be both, in a sense, God, and also, in a real sense, a human. And he is called Son of God, sometimes referring to his his divine side. And he's called Son of Man as a reference, in my opinion, to his human side. Now, Bible scholars will usually give a more elaborate answer than that. They'll say that in the in the intertestamental period, that is after the Old Testament was completed, but before the New Testament times, there were some books like the Book of Enoch, which introduced to the Jewish uh, folklore uh, a hero referred to as the Son of Man. And this, uh, the Book of Enoch was very popular and, and widely read by the Jews of Jesus' time. So some people think that when Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man, he was identifying himself with this hero figure in the book of Enoch. Um, I'm not as inclined as many are to see it that way. That's kind of the, I think that probably it's, it's the scholarly, scholarly vogue to explain it that way, but I've, I've never been very convinced by it. I don't really think that Jesus was guided very much by uninspired writers of the intertestamental period. I think he was much more inspired by the Old Testament. Now in the Old Testament, the term son of man is used a whole lot of times, but in almost every case, in fact, in every case other than Daniel chapter uh, 7 uh, and verse 12 and 13, every case other than that, the term son of man in the Old Testament just means a mere man. Uh, it's, it's used to simply mean a mere man, a son of Adam, as opposed to something more than a man. And what's interesting is that Jesus would use such a humbling term for himself. Uh, he was certainly more than a mere man. But he was not less than a mere man. Some people try to diminish the fact that he actually became one of us. Some people see him much more as a, a different kind of 
creature that's more God than man. I think that Jesus emphasized that he was man. Uh, he was a man as well as God. It was God. It's when you saw Jesus, you saw what happens when God takes on a human form as a human, a real human man. Now there is that passage I mentioned in Daniel chapter seven, around verse twelve, thirteen. It talks about you know, Daniel said, "I saw one like the Son of Man, or like a Son of Man, you know, coming in the clouds of heaven, and you know he came to the Ancient of Days, and he sat down and was given a kingdom." Many people feel like Jesus is referring to that passage. And certainly Jesus did uh, cite imagery from that passage. He did talk about the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven and so forth a few times. So, so the passage in Daniel was not at all absent from Jesus' mind. But the fact that it's called a Son of Man still is a term that's used uh, scores of times in the Old Testament to, to mean a mere man. So, I, you know, there's different opinions as to what Jesus was trying to get across when he called himself the Son of Man. He called himself that more than he called himself anything else. I think he called himself that about 70 times in the New Testament, and, and no one else called him that. Uh, his disciples never called him the Son of Man. He only called himself that. The only exception is that when Stephen was being stoned and he saw the heaven open, he saw Jesus in heaven, he said, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God the Father. That's the only person, Stephen, on that occasion, the only person who ever referred to Jesus as the Son of Man. It was always Jesus' favorite term for himself and, and exclusively used by himself apart from that one case. So uh, what did he, re what, why was he using that term? Well, it certainly is the case that he was a son of man. Uh, he was son of, of the human race, in other words. And he was a real man, not something less than a real man, and not something superhuman. He was, in a sense, what God is when he becomes a human, when God takes on a human form. And, uh, and, and what that means is a mystery to us all, I'm sure. But his reason for using the term either, uh, there's like three possibilities, as I mentioned. One is that he's referring to the book of Enoch and the Son of Man character there, which I do not accept as a likelihood, although it's kind of a, a reigning consensus among scholarship, it would appear to me. Uh, or else he's referring to Daniel chapter 7, which refers to the Son of Man. Or he's using the term the way it was used throughout the Old Testament and among the Jews to refer to being genuinely part of humanity, uh, a real son of Adam. So you can kind of take your pick or you can just remain undecided like me and say, well, I, think he, I personally think he was simply emphasizing his humanity, but maybe he had something much more that I'm missing, and that'd be okay with me. I'll find out someday. Sam from Dallas, Texas. Hey, Dal Sam, welcome. Hi, Steve. How are you? Fine, thanks. Yeah, hey, Steve. I have heard that uh, the Eastern uh, Orthodox Church, like the Russian Orthodox Church, so what do they believe? What do they believe? And how they are different uh uh, from the Egyptian Coptic Church. Well, that's going to be a hard one for me because I'm not very familiar with the Coptic Church. Um, and, and I'm really not very and familiar. I, with the, I will take the answer off here, okay? Uh, okay, that's fine. I'm really not that familiar with the Eastern Orthodox Church. I've known people who are Eastern Orthodox, and I've been inside of an Eastern Orthodox Church, but I don't know much. I haven't studied Eastern, Eastern Orthodox enough to answer much. I'll say for a for a Protestant like myself, or someone from a Protestant background, uh, looking at the Eastern Orthodox and looking at the Roman Catholic, you don't see very much difference. Uh, both churches have a lot of traditions that Protestants in general do not accept. They have you know, their, their traditions about Mary, for example, and so forth, uh, which is you know, one of the things that Protestants often associate with Roman Catholicism. Actually, it is part of Roman Catholicism. It's also part of Eastern Orthodoxy. And uh, and there are other traditions like that which Protestants would not accept, but which are common to both Eastern Orthodoxy and, uh, and Roman Catholic. Of course, both groups are very highly uh, liturgical and, and formal compared to most Protestant churches. And, and uh, you know, the wearing the robes and things like that by the clergy is something that would be, uh, again, unfamiliar to most Protestants. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has statues of saints and people like that. The... Eastern Orthodox doesn't have statues. They have what they call icons, which are just pieces of wood with paintings of saints. So instead of a three-dimensional 
statue of a saint. They actually have a flat painting of a saint. And actually, this this uh, difference of opinion, whether they should have icons or not, uh, is one of the things that split the Eastern Church and the Western Church apart back in the 12th cent- or the 11th century. And, you know, to me, it sounds like a really small matter because I, I don't think it's a good idea to have statues or icons in a church. Uh, graven images in the church are not, to my mind, uh, certainly not essential, and they might even not be really appropriate. So that's me as a non-Catholic, non-Eastern Orthodox person talking. Now, the Eastern Orthodox don't have the Pope. Uh, they don't They don't follow the Pope. They've never been, well, they, when they split, it's like the, the patriarch of Constantinople, I think, would fill the role uh, in their church as the highest uh, official. But I don't believe that they dictate as much to their people as far as their, you know, standardizing beliefs as I think the Roman Catholic Church does. There are some differences, but the differences that exist are not great enough to make me attracted to either of them. To me, uh, many of the things that I would find unappealing about the Roman Catholic Church, the Eucharist, for example, the idea of transubstantiation, I would find uh, difficult also if I were to go to the Eastern Orthodox Church. I, I, there's, I'm afraid there's more similarities between them than there are between either of them and, and any Protestants. Uh, so it's a different movement. Now, the, the Coptic Church in Africa... I don't know very much about their practices at all. You know, we don't really encounter Coptics very often here. They are around, but we don't, you know, it's mainly an African branch of Christianity uh, from early days. We do, of course, always meet Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox people around. But, you know, because I don't really deal with Coptic people, I haven't really studied their their distinctives much. So I'm afraid I'm ignorant about, about that. Uh, I guess in my own thinking... From what I picked up, which isn't very authoritative, I would say I would expect there to be a high degree of similarity between Eastern Orthodox and Coptic, but I wouldn't be able to affirm that because I really don't know very much about that. Uh, Scott from Denver, Colorado, welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve, thank you very much and appreciate your ministry. Thank you. Um, I have a, my question is uh, Have you heard of or read Emmanuel Swedenborg? And if you have, uh, what were your general thoughts? And well, if not, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was just going to say I have not read Swedenborg. I know that. Uh, well, I, I know for one thing that he did not believe in the deity of Christ, uh, in the sense of I think Orthodox Christianity does. I don't know very much about his other beliefs. I believe that Helen Keller was a Swedenborgian, wasn't she? She was. She was. Yeah. There's a. If uh, if you identify yourself as a Swedenborgian because you believe in, you know, maybe some things that he's written, but there are a lot uh-huh. of people, yes. Um, yeah, I'm not very familiar with his I teaching. Guess, say again? I'm not very familiar with his teaching, actually. Uh, okay. Well, then my other general question would just be, in the 2,000-plus years since Christ, the thought on these very personal extraordinary experiences that men and women have written down much like enoch um, okay okay as you can hear the music's playing and i'm going to be cut off here in about a half a half a minute um maybe you could call back monday and we could talk at more length without having to cut you off so short Uh, it sounded like you're asking me what i think about these various you know mystical experiences some christians have had through the ages I'd say I'd have to judge them case by case uh, by, you know, what was the fruit? That's how that's how you judge such things. How do they la- stack up with what Jesus said and what the Bible says? We're out of time. Thanks for joining us. We are listener support. You can go to thenarrowpath.com to see how to support us or just to take the resources there. Thenarrowpath.com. Let's talk again Monday. God bless you.